Good afternoon and welcome to the session on Dutch coffee machine tokens. I'm your host, Peter Kranevelt. There are over 600 types of Dutch coffee machine tokens, so I can't show them all. Instead, I will focus on the story they tell about how the Dutch economy developed. I hope this will bring these tokens, looking so dull at first sight, to life. The pictures in this presentation come from the website World of Tokens. This site is owned and maintained by World of Coins, a coin forum devoted to going in depth on coins of all ages and places. The pictures were donated by World of Coin members. Having coffee on the job is more than a social gesture. It is a well understood common interest. Employees wanted coffee to wake up in the morning, to drive away the sleep in the early afternoon, for a pause after completing an exhausting job, to fight cold when working in the open air, and for many other reasons. Employers realized that providing coffee worked in favor of productivity and labor retention. Have a look at the token on this page. It is a coffee token, predating coffee machines. The aircraft coming at you from the token is a Kohlhoven. Fritz Kohlhoven was a builder of military and civilian aircraft, competitor of Fokker. When the Nazis invaded in 1940, the factory was bombed out. This token could be used to buy coffee from a coffee server, making the rounds in the morning. The coffee server had a large factory-made kettle strapped on his back. The kettle was equipped with a tube ending in a tap. The server would fill paper cups by opening the tap. The service was innovative, but not widely adopted. Please have a look at the agenda before we move on. We have already discovered how Fritz Kohlhoven served coffee on legs. It took coffee vending machines to give the idea flight. We imported from the US. A traveling salesman from Amsterdam, Van Duinen, took them apart and put them back together again while he understood perfectly how they worked. With that knowledge, he built his own machines and service organization. Early coffee machines used powdered coffee. They offered the favorite variants of coffee, black, black with sugar, and milky, known in Dutch as koffie verkeerd, koffie verkeerd wrongly made coffee. Marketing in the early days stressed that the machines did not need an attendant for making coffee and washing cups, and that they made fresh hot coffee. Time saving included not waiting in line and not having to leave the grounds for coffee breaks. Later machines using freeze dried coffee had more possibilities, such as frothy milk, cocoa powder, and hot water, allowing vending of hot, fancier hot drinks like cappuccino, vina melange, which is a mixture of coffee and cocoa, hot chocolate, and tea. Companies could create food and drink vending machine banks in their canteens, including cold drinks and snacks. Plants operating around, operating around the clock, like the main shell refinery, could even offer whole meals to the night shift. Most food and drink machines on the company grounds worked on circulating coins. However, coffee could be subsidized, and the subsidy was aimed only at company staff. And so, the coffee vending machine token was born. The demise of the coffee token was a trend for employees, for employers to provide free coffee. By the 90s, almost 95% of the coffee at work was free. We still know little about who made these tokens. The names of the tokens are often coffee machine sellers and buyers. They rarely made tokens. They probably bought them from middlemen or professional makers. A prime, a prime suspect is the Dutch Royal Mint in Utrecht. Documentation of their production is not yet discovered, but research is underway. Correspondence, offers, and offers of coffee machines to the mint have surfaced. More will undoubtedly follow. Meanwhile, we look for factors that make tokens fall into groups that were undoubtedly produced by the same maker. Design may be an important lead. Those with complicated design or logo 
are more likely to have been made by the Utrecht Mint. The three design patterns you see occur on many tokens without a logo from widely diverse companies. Diameter is a vague indication of the brand of machines used or the token maker. The metal used may be a time indicator. The oldest tokens are shiny copper nickel affairs, but in the course of time they were succeeded by copper nickel clad and brass tokens. Magnetism and weight do not seem to have played a role. Look beyond territory and size and the Netherlands grows bigger. Best forget the tulip fields, wooden shoes and windmills. In the heyday of the coffee token, the Dutch population was similar to that of Australia. Its natural gas reserves in the northeast of the country compare to those of, those of Algeria, a country that put a drilling platform on one of its coins. Its agricultural exports had a global reach. Rotterdam alone boasted as many harbour cranes as all of the United Kingdom. Its commercial fleet was one of the largest in the world. It produced aircraft, ships, trains, cars, even bicycles in plants that used coffee machine tokens. The oldest of the coffee token using enterprises came about in the 18th century. After the Napoleonic War, the world industrialized with steam machines taking over manual labor and iron and steel replacing wood. Selling the right product, profiting from modernization, created a class of entrepreneurs and cheap, industrially made products. This period was interrupted by the First World War. The Netherlands remained neutral, but it served, suffered nevertheless. Submarine warfare and mines made sea transport dangerous. The colonies were isolated. Export markets were closed. Demand withered. Peace brought electrification, another opportunity. Even before the war, horse trams replaced electric trams. After the war, the local grids were connected. Machines got faster and more precise. Smokestacks became a threatened species. The period of growth was concluded by the crash of the 30s. Ecos learned important lessons, but companies had a hard time struggling through, and employees had an even harder time keeping their job and feeding their families. The surviving companies emerged bigger than ever. All that just led to another world war. It was a disaster for the Netherlands. Tens of thousands were killed. A famine in the winter of 1945 further decimated the population. Rotterdam was bombed out. Holders flooded, salting good agricultural land. Industrial equipment was stolen. The whole transport infrastructure destroyed. When Allied troops arrived at last, emigration took flight as many despaired of recovery. A mix of painful economic reforms, communist threat, martial aid from the US, and the German Wirtschaftswunder turned things around. The environment of the coffee tokens was one of very rapid growth and great opportunity. Still, companies with important ties to the colonies were caught by decolonization. At the same time, European economic integration started changing everything. As borders opened, traditional industries suddenly found themselves exposed to competition from much larger companies. The whole sector of the economy merged and disappeared if they couldn't ch change fast enough. In the final years of the coffee token, electronics started to remake the world again. Plastic cards replaced money. It did not matter much to the coffee tokens. Colonies or no colonies, coffee was becoming free for the employees. When the Romans invaded, the people living in what is now the Netherlands were already building ships. The country acquired a great seafaring tradition, the basis of great wealth, but also a colonial empire that involved at one time areas from Taiwan to Brazil and from South Africa to New Amsterdam, now New York. For 16 generations, the Smith family played a key role in shipbuilding. Their story starts 
with Jacques Luidertsoorn van Vreem, Flemish Protestant who escaped persecution and settled in Kinderdijk as a smith. He died in 1695. His offspring took the family name Smit. Some were car carpenters, others were smiths. That combination proved ideal when wooden ships were succeeded by steel ships. They started their own yard as well as a tug service. The seventh generation added another yard, De Noort. This yard would become the most important in the country due to a tactical marriage in the eighth gen generation of a smith with the daughter of yard owner van der Giesen. Their son merged their yards in Alblasserdam Amsterdam and Krimpen aan den IJssel to van der Giesen de Noord. For decades, their huge covered yard in Krimpen was the largest of its kind in Europe. From there on, things went downhill due to Asian competition. Viable parts of a number of yards ended HC a government supported attempts to save what could be saved. The JKS token refers to the Smith brothers Jan and Case, Jan Kees in English. They had their own yard at Kinderdijk, competing with their family they didn't get along didn't get along with. LSZ stands for Leendert Smith and Zonen, tug service known by sailors around the world as the people who can save their ship and their lives. In port cities all over the world, smith tugs are known by name and recognized on site. Smith's accomplishment is removing 41 wrecks from the Suez Canal in record time after the Suez Crisis. Boat made a successful switch from wood to metal that allowed the company to grow from inland vessels to seagoing fishermen, fishermen and ship engines. Nevertheless, boat could not cope with low wage cost Asian shipbuilding. The Vug token is a recent discovery. This seems likely to be another case of pre war coffee on legs. The yard produced seagoing smaller vessels. It was hit by both world wars and the crisis of the 30s, but survived. In the face of Asian competition, it gave up shipbuilding and repair and went into ship engine building. Buck ended up in IHC. Amos is the only survivor in this group. It changed from wood to metal in time and survived all economic challenges. When Asian competition killed its competitors, Amos had already switched to luxury boat building. Amos is no longer independent, but its name is still globally recognized as a top class boat builder. Almost all of these once important companies have succumbed to change they could not deal with. However, the demise was not the end of the Dutch economy. They just made place for something more efficient. If you're based in a small country, you have small options. You can grow as big as the competition, like Philips, or you can work in an international partnership, such as Shell and Unilever. But these companies are well known, so I'm skipping them today. Instead, let's look at the most fun option, being the first or the best in the market, as long as it lasts, of course. Unlike wine, ideas grow stale quickly. Here are some examples. CPB, the Central Test Animals Agency, was an arm of TNO, a government scientific institute for applied research. Their idea was to raise animals for research in a strictly controlled environment. The animals, the animals were mostly mice with a constant genetic mix. This was important for reliable testing. The animals were used in particular for food safety. Their impeccable compa comparability and health created demand from, from research institutes in a large number of countries. New testing techniques made lab, lab animals superfluous. Nieder was the brain, brainchild of Mr. Donker Duivis, better known as DD. DD was an enterprise oriented documentalist who was frustrated by the a technical and literary approach of the librarians of his days. He discovered 
Universal Decimal Classification, or UDC, a Belgian creation, and became its principal propagandist. UDC claims to be able to organize all human knowledge in a complete decimal system. Armed with the UDC, DD coded unpublished texts, patents, magazine articles that would otherwise have remained inaccessible. He created giant registers of coded material by requiring that all neither staff, including himself, spend time making library cards. He was finally stopped by the advent of computers that could search more, better and faster than any human with a register. Willem Gispen's big idea, art could be produced industrial. De René Lalique came up with the same idea 10 years before, but he applied it to decorative items. Hispen went for furniture. He was invited to the exhibition Die Wohnung in Stuttgart. Hispen instantly became a recognized modernistic designer. It allowed him to work with other famous modernists, such as architects Mies van der Rohe and Out, and furniture Gerrit Rietveld. Hispen's designs were artful, thoughtful, simple, but luxurious. Hispen won spectacular orders, including the furniture of the headquarters of Unilever. As Hispen's financial savvy left to be desired, his financial backers insisted on a finan financial director. During the Second World War, Hispen went into hiding and his financial director took over. Hispen, Hispen left the company. Early Hispen furniture is collected and increasingly found in museum collections. The Van Dorne brothers came up with a novel automatic transmission. Lighter, easier to maintain, more efficient than classical automatic transmissions. But their attempts to interest car companies failed, so the brothers added passenger cars to their factory's production and used their transmission in buses, trucks and tanks. The passenger car production line was sold to Volvo and the rest of the company became DAF trucks. The car producing world, dominated by a handful of US, Japanese and German enterprises, never used a transmission system they hadn't invented themselves. Leo Koppens is a virtually unknown name, even in the Netherlands, but he's my hero. He was a farmer's son but he preferred to repair, to repair his father's tractor. Leo worked at a factory for a while, then started his own company, but the Nazi occupation deprived of him of petrol. So he stole petrol from the occupation army. He was caught, accused of sabotage, a capital crime. Lucky Leo was freed after two years. After the war, Leo's breakthrough came when he invented a fully automatic petrol pump. Now, clients could fill up after opening hours. Leo's first client for this invention was Esso. His second client was Shell. He branched out to fully automatic car wash equipment for petrol stations. A year before his death, lucky Leo sold his enterprise to a French-American oil company. That leaves one more option for a small open economy. Get the foreigners to come to you. Coca-Cola came for a reason, it sponsored the 1928 Amsterdam Olympics. The company liked what it saw and stayed, building a plant on the outskirts of Amsterdam. The Am Hilton Hotel looks quite American and out of place. However, with time, the building became completely accepted. The hotel has a colorful history, including a bed in by Yoko Ono and John Lennon to protest the Vietnam War, the suicide of a Dutch rock singer by jumping from the roof, and the hotel bar being the meeting place of high rolling criminals, one of whom was murdered around the corner from the hotel. Uh, by the way, uh, the tokens could only be used in the staff canteen. After the Second World War, Oxbro, a US company specialized in measuring technology for the process industry, became a success story by making advances in miniaturization, leading to a shift from local control to centralized control rooms. In 1959, Foxborough established a small plant in Soest for the assembly of transmitters. 
plant grew to become the European head headquarters of Foxpro. Foxpro became entangled in a series of mishaps, in particular because of premature introduction of intelligent automation. Market share dropped precipitously, and the Seuss factory was closed in 1990. IKEA, in half-assembled furniture in flat cartons. That packaging and marketing aimed at young families made IKEA furniture cheap, solid, and successful. IKEA came to the Netherlands in 1978, opening a large furniture supermarket in Sliedrecht, near Rotterdam, followed in quick succession by other shops. Sliedrecht is now closed, and Delft, where this coffee token was used, is the main seat in the Netherlands. Siemens is a German enterprise producing telecommunication and electrical machinery for industrial and household use. Since 1868, Siemens had a production facility in Hengelo. In 1891, Siemens opens its, opened its first foreign technical agency in The Hague. The choice of The Hague was perhaps influenced by the state's efforts to electrify the country. Household machine activities were eventually added, added leading to a full-fledged Siemens branch. The fortunes of the plants have moved up and down with those of the mother company. I have now run out of time after showing you only a handful of tokens. Don't worry, there are many more tokens on World of Tokens, whose address is on your screen now. You will find not only the tokens, but also technical details, background information, and pictures relating to the texts on the tokens. The text is made, the site is made with Wikipedia software, so you may contribute what you want when you have time. We still need pictures and information on a few companies, so consider yourself encouraged to have a look and help where you can. By the way, World of Tokens contains many other categories of tokens. And with that, I thank you for your attention and look forward to your comments and questions.